you know, I've met him. Oh, you met him? He invited him here. Oh, really? All right, folks. All right. So, good morning, everyone. It's Thank you. Yeah, right. All right, so it's good to see so many people here to think and talk, and as the subject matter of the panel goes, to think twice about child soldiers. The event is inspired by thinking in a better way about how to deal with the scourge of child soldiering and how to reintegrate and rehabilitate young folks who have become militarized. And one source of the start is a book that I co-edited, which published uh, in September. My co-editor is a British lawyer, Justine Barrett. She just had a baby in November and is currently on uh, maternity leave. So she's not here, but I am. And we've got a number of real bright lights to share their thoughts with you. Now, time is tight, so let me begin with some introductions. So the first concept I want to introduce is the child soldier. So who is a child soldier? Child soldiers are individuals under the age of 18 who are associated with armed forces or armed groups. The definition of child soldiering is chronological in terms of age and very capacious in terms of what associated with armed forces or armed groups means. It can cover everything from carrying a weapon and serving in combatant roles to serving auxiliary roles, such as cooking, cleaning, portering, acting in ways like a saboteur. And it can also encompass coerced familial roles, like being a forced spouse or being coerced into sexual slavery. Where are child soldiers? Child soldiers are found on every continent. How do people become child soldiers? three main paths. Abduction and coercion is one. Enlistment is a second, and it's one that is radically under-theorized. Young people at times exercise agency and volunteerism in coming forward to join. Armed forces, of course, are the national armies of states, and armed groups are militarized wings attached <coughs> to non-state actors, rebel groups, for example. And how do we think about child soldiers? We tend to think about child soldiers now as faultless, passive victims, as desiccated by war, as emotionally dilapidated, as suffering enormously. And that reflects a trend in which the intersection of children and armed conflict has moved from a question of military ethics to one of law and policy. Children have always been enmeshed with armed forces or armed groups in times of violence, but the decision historically to involve children in this fashion was often seen as a question of, of ethics. Often in desperate times, children became recruited, but today we see the possibility of young people becoming militarized as a flat impossibility because we lack the plausibility anymore of constructing children who are militarized in many ways as other than faultless victims. Double standards, of course, abound. I'm going to share something that I received in November from my younger son's grade five class, homework he brought home, and it's entitled boy, soldier, war hero. And it talks about Jack Lucas, who I'd never heard of before. Jack Lucas was 14 when he signed up to fight in World War II, and his bravery in battle made him a hero. We would no longer speak of a 14-year-old who fights in the same fashion. These are some of the questions that I'd like us to collectively unpack today. We have the great privilege of having four speakers, each of whom contributed a chapter to the book. I'm going to introduce them very briefly in the order in which they'll speak. Our first presenter is Professor Mohamed Kamara, who teaches French and French literature and is the chair of the Africana Studies Department here at Washington and Lee University. 
Professor Kamara has published extensively on Leopold Senghor in a literary tradition in the Senegalese context, and he's got ongoing research projects that relate to a study <coughs> of French colonial education. Professor Kamara's chapter to our volume adopts a perspective of the child soldier as presented in literature. Our second speaker to my far right is Professor Miriam Denov, who is a full professor at McGill University and holds the Canada Research Chair in Youth, Gender, and Armed Conflict. Professor Denov's research lies at the heart of questions of children and families affected by war. She is a pioneer in terms of qualitative uh, participatory research methods and has conducted on the ground work in a variety of jurisdictions all over the world. She's also presented expert evidence before courts on child soldiers and has served as an advisor to numbers of groups. She's also a richly published author, having written, I think, five books on the subject matter, and her prose is really elegant and compelling, and I'm lucky because we're working on an article together. <laughs> Our third presenter is Professor Valerie Oosterveld, to my immediate right. Professor Oosterveld is Professor of International Law at the University of Western Ontario. Professor Oosterveld, before entering academia, has a distinguished record of advocacy and uh, negotiation in terms of the creation of the International Criminal Court on behalf of the Legal Affairs Bureau of Canada's Department of Foreign Affairs. Professor Oosterveld in my opinion, is the leading global scholar on questions of the intersectionality of gender, marriage, coercion, and gender-based violence. Without her considerable writing, thinking, and advocacy efforts, international law itself would not look the way that it looks now, and questions of gender-based violence in a variety of forms would be much emptier and thinner as they are now. Our final speaker is Joseph Rickoff. Joseph Rickoff is an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Common Law of the University of Ottawa. Like Professor Oosterveld, prior to and commingled with his teaching, he has a distinguished track record of legal advocacy and legal practice when it comes to war crimes and crimes against humanity, once again with the Canadian government. He has thought long and hard and advocated long and hard and represented long and hard on the specific intersectionalities of children with regards to refugee status claims, intersectionality of young people with regards to asylum and matters of immigration. In addition to a robust career of legal practice, he has also found time somehow to publish over 45 articles, as well as several books. His most recent book, which I had the pleasure to review for the Journal of International Criminal Justice, wasn't just a little book, it was huge. It was hundreds and hundreds of pages long. And he did have a co-author, but I don't know how that division went. All this to say, I'm going to stop soon so we can get on with the program, but I'm gonna say two things before I sit down first. It's really a privilege to have such wonderful folks here today with us now. And none of this would be possible at all without the hard work of two people, Terry Burns and Allegra Steck, without whom this event would not exist and would not have had the opportunity to come together. And I thank them profusely. I also thank Chris Seaman and the Law Center for funding. Before I sit down, I want one more thing to happen. I'd like a big Lexington welcome for these folks. So <laughs> each speaker will speak for about 12 minutes. I don't like having to do this, but I'm gonna watch you like a hawk. <laughs> so I, I don't need my time, are you you're gonna I'm gonna do it. it. Yeah. Just add some suspense. Can you let me know when I have two minutes left? I will. 
Thank you. <laughs> we have a bullhorn, I hope. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We're glad to, to be here over from the other side. Uh, and thank you, Mark, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, project. I remember when you first mentioned it, and I said, why not? Uh, and several months later, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. So, and I have taught a full-blown course on the child soldier thanks to this particular project. Uh, and I intend to continue my work uh, on this. Um, and I would like to thank my colleagues uh, who have traveled further than I have to be here. Uh, Mark has pretty much said everything I was going to say. Uh, he's just said it in fewer words. So bear with me. Uh, in case you hear some of the same things. And uh, I'll just give you a, basically a summary of my chapter, uh, and then we'll have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about some of the other details uh, from it. Uh, my chapter is uh, titled In Search of the Lost Kingdom of Childhood, uh, Victimhood, Agency, Resilience, and the Child Soldier. Uh, I use three first-person narratives Amadou Koroma's Allah is not obliged, uh, Emmanuel Dongala's journey Mad Dog, and Ishmael Bear's A Long Way Gone as my primary sources of reference to engage a series of questions. What is childhood? What does it mean to be a child soldier? How does the definition of childhood, legal or otherwise, jibe with the child's own perception or understanding of his or her place and perhaps role in society? Did the child have a childhood before becoming a soldier? Each of the three major characters I study in the essay is engaged in an odyssey of sorts, a journey with serious implications for the lifetime of the traveler, the child, but also for the society. What are the child's circumstances before the journey? What does she do or what gets done to him or her during the odyssey? Does she return home and to a family? Are home and family still there? and the same post-war? Was there really home or family to start with? What are home and family in the context of society writ large? Does the journey really end? What does the experience of the child say about society as a whole? By engaging these questions, I hope to interrogate the larger question pertaining to agency, victimhood, and the human capacity to transcend uh, adversity, focusing more specifically on how the child or child soldier negotiates the treacherous road upon which uh, he or she has been thrust with no properly functioning compass, if there is any compass at all. Allah is not obliged is about Birahima, an orphan preteen boy forced to search for his maternal aunt, who, as custom dictates, should be his new mother after his mother passed away. The aunt lives somewhere in war-torn Liberia. The whole story tracks the boy and the adult who accompanies him moving through one conflict uh, into another. The aunt dies just before they get to her. Johnny Mad Dog is about the eponymous antihero Johnny, also known as Mad Dog. Johnny's account is framed and counterbalanced by that of a more reliable narrator, Lao Kole, a girl who happens to share his age and who, at age 16, becomes mother to her mother and her little brother after the rest of her family has been destroyed by the war in which Johnny takes part willingly. Of the three novels, A Long Way Gone is the only autobiographical one. Ishmael Beer's memoirs are a harrowing expose on the causes and consequences of the militarization of children. Ishmael is barely 13 years old when he joins the ranks of uh, the Sierra Leonean army. By the time of his demobilization at age 15, he had become a drug addict and an efficient killing machine, one for whom, and I quote, killing had become as easy as drinking water. The rest of my chapter after this synopsis of the stories is divided into five sections and the conclusion. Uh, exiting childhood, uh, the oxymoron of a child soldier, reasons children join armed forces, and uh, two other sections, that is the uh, question of victimhood and free agency, as well as the capacity to adapt through memory and resilience to new realities. 
In Exiting Childhood, I highlight the section with a quotation that I feel quite accurately captures the situation the child about to be a soldier finds himself uh, in. In the Sony PlayStation's God of War, Kratos, a Spartan war uh, god, prepares his son for what is ahead. And I quote, On our journey, we will be attacked by all manner of creature. To be effective in combat, a warrior must not feel for his enemy. Close your heart to their desperation. Close your heart to their suffering. The road ahead is long and unforgiving. No place for a boy. You must be a warrior. The advice uh, Credo gives his son as he ushers him into the new reality is the same advice in one form or another given to all child soldiers by those who use them as sidekicks or instruments of war. Children, it is often said, want to grow up fast. War certainly accelerate, accelerates that process for them. Oxymoron of the child soldier. There is widespread agreement amongst humanitarian and human rights advocates that 18 should be the threshold for the recruitment and use of children in armed conflicts, the straight 18 principle. And efforts are afoot have been for a while to bring international law in line with this approach. Given this consensus, the terminology child soldier and all its avatars is an oxymoron clearly. In all three texts that I study, the writers and their characters grapple with the notion of childhood and the confusion that accompanies the treatment and participation of children in armed conflicts. Ishmael Beyer proclaims a final indictment on the contradictory notion when he reminds participants at a UN conference in New York just after his demobilization, and I quote, I have been rehabilitated now, so don't be afraid of me. I am not a child soldier anymore. I am a child. So why do children become soldiers? And Mark has already given us all the reasons for that. The main reason, of course, children join armies is because <coughs> adults want them to and let them, either through force or through the dereliction of their responsibility, voluntarily or otherwise, to protect children and their childhood. Lao Kole in Johnny Mad Dog gives us the most scathing and comprehensive assessment of this fact, implicating all levels of society in the destruction of our childhood. And I quote, if I had gone to America, I would have been in college now, since my grades had always been good. But no, at 16, I had to flee the bullets on the very day I was due to take my baccalaureate exam. And here I was, shipwrecked in the middle of the rainforest, with no father, no mother, no brother. What had I done to deserve this? I cursed my country and its politicians. So the family, the loss of the family, the failure of the state to protect the children are all implicated in this. And in addition to this, of course, the lure of power, control, access to basic resources, uh, as well as a sense of one's personal worth and belonging, because losing a family by joining a rebel movement or a military provides another family. So that sense of belonging is also an attraction for children uh, who join armed forces. And the question of victimhood and agency, uh, the question as to why children become combatants already assumes a certain degree of agency on the part of some of the children at least. Indeed, we know for sure that unlike Ishmael, uh, who had to be forced to carry arms, though he ends up enamored of them, both Birahima and Johnny, the two other kids, willingly join their respective ragtag armies. Birahima refuses to deliver at some point in the war because he had the habit of delivering uh, orations for the lost children, his, his colleagues in, in the war. He tells us why he refuses to deliver orations for a certain group of children, and I quote, they were more like the devil's children than the good lords. All three of them were bastards, druggies, criminals, liars. They were cursed. I don't want to say a funeral oration for the damned. What are we to make of this harsh judgment by Birahim or of his fellow ch child soldiers? Why are the other children deserving of funeral orations, but not these three? Though it is easy to see that all child soldiers are more or less bastards, druggies, criminals, liars. 
How much weight should we give to the self-judgment of a preteen who clearly has not had the benefit of a strong moral or social education? Or maybe a question to ask is how? How did these particular children become bastards, druggies, criminals, and liars? Was it a conscious choice on their part? How much free will do Birahima and other children have? And how much latitude do they have to exercise this free will, if they had it at all? Moreover, should they be held accountable for actions committed under adult supervision and instigation? Is one's victimization an excuse to victimize others? Nowhere is the victim perpetrator conundrum more glaring than in the case of Dominic Ongwen, the Ugandan child soldier who, of course, was arrested as an adult, uh, currently under trial in the Hague for crimes of war and against humanity. The question of adaptability and resilience. To survive in a new environment, children, like adults, are required to adapt in one fashion or another to their new reality. The, the, the Kerpo trials in Israel between 1951 and 1964, for example, exposed the extent to which people can go to stay alive. The ability to normalize new realities or become desensitized to their effects constitute a form of adaptability to them. Lao Kole, the girl we've already met, makes this salient observation on more than one occasion. The brain is an extraordinary organ. Two minutes left. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I see him shuffling his papers. Here. I love you too. <laughs> Thank you. So, so Lao Kole makes this observation, and I quote from her: "The brain is an extraordinary organ. After an hour of fear and dread, and she is making this statement right after a major bombardment of an area where she is. After an hour of fear and dread, on the bombardment." Mine, my brain, adapted to the situation. It transformed the whistlings, shock waves, and explosions into routine sounds that were nothing more than familiar background noise. My terror faded, and my body relaxed. End of quote. Whereas adaptability could be an end in itself, that is, a point of no return, which seems to be Johnny's case because he's the only one who dies in conflict, and the other children get out of it somehow. Resilience is a necessary condition of rehabilitation, as is clearly the case with Ishmael and somewhat with Birahima, and both rescued from war. Uh, Ishmael, we, we know his story today. He's an advocate uh, for the cause of child soldiers and their re uh, rehabilitation in society. Birahima is a fictional character who gets rescued uh, but there is a follow-up to this story. He ends up going back to war to look for somebody else. So resilience, like the Sankofa bird uh, in the Akan tradition, uh, Adinkra tradition, is at once backward-looking and forward-projecting. It drags along from the rubbles of the past the very soul of the future. The foundation of resilience, of course, is memory. And without memory, one can never be resilient enough to make it successfully into the future. For those with childhood memories that are better forgotten, the task of rehabilitation becomes that much harder. And this is the case especially with Birahima, who has never experienced uh, anything uh, pleasurable in his life before he became a child soldier. So to conclude, the child soldier <coughs> sits at the crossroads of childhood, theoretical or lived, in adulthood, often without wishing to be there. It is a dangerous place to be, of course. Depending on the force of the wind and the way it is blowing, the child will live fully again, as in the case of Ishmael, or be damaged forever, as in the case of Johnny, and to some extent, uh, uh, Birahima. As Ishmael reminds us, and I quote, children have the resilience to outlive their sufferings if given the chance, end of quote. Ishmael's true and exemplary story of rehabilitation is proof of this. Thank you.
inviting me here today. I wanted to just start by saying a big thank you, first of all, to Mark uh, and Justine for including me in this really important book that came into being and, uh, and uh, is a really important contribution to what's already out there. So thank you for that. And also, um, just for, I've been wanting to meet some of these people for like my entire career, and so it's really nice to be able to be here and finally meet them in person, and um, I'm really happy to be here. So today I'm going to be talking about the context of Northern Uganda, and for those of you who are not familiar with the context, I wanted to give you a very quick kind of overview, summary of the war, um, and as, it, as I go on, you'll, it'll give you a bit of context in, in terms of the children that I'm going to be talking about. So in northern Uganda, between 1986 and 2007, um, a two-decade-long uh, civil war where uh, an armed group called the Lord's Resistance Army, or what I'm going to call for short the LRA, um, try, was trying to overthrow the Ugandan government. And in, uh, in the midst of that, committed horrific atrocities against um, civilians. <clears throat> During the course of the war, the LRA abducted an estimated 80,000 children. 30% um, of those children were girls, uh, and those girls were targeted specifically uh, for domestic work, to work as fighters and combatants, and also targeted for sexual violence. And the leader of the LRA, Joseph Kony, um, deliberately instituted a system of forced marriage. And so those girls that were abducted, who were um, largely between the ages of 12 and 14, um, became the property of a uh, male commander. And those uh, girls were victims of repeated <coughs> sexual violence. And many uh, became pregnant and gave birth to children born in captivity. Now, not all of those children that were born in captivity survived, but in the aftermath of the war, um, the, there are thousands of children who were born in LRA captivity that are currently living in northern Uganda. And we have very little knowledge of uh, what the lives of those children uh, were like, uh, what does it mean to grow up in uh, the context of an armed group, and so, as part of my research, um, I did field work in northern Uganda um, with uh, 80 children who had been born in captivity. And I'm going to try to, as much as I can, draw on their direct voices, um, as they can speak far better than, uh, than I can. So what's unique about this group of child soldiers is that unlike being abducted, um, that we've heard about, or unlike actively joining an armed group, these children were born into an armed group and spent their formative years, uh, for many, living in the context of an armed group. And, and this experience is quite unique and has implications for how we understand child soldiers and also how we uh, begin to rehabilitate in the aftermath of, of, of a conflict. So the important thing is that these children, although they, they talk about being in the bush, um, and for child soldiers who have been abducted, this idea of being uh, taken and brought to the bush in the context of war means that the war has a specific place. But for these children that I'm talking about, the, the, the context of the bush, bush was actually home. As this young person said, the bush was not seen as the bush to me. It was home. Um, and so what I want to emphasize is that these children living in these contexts experience brutal forms of violence uh, in their daily lives. Starvation, injury, fear, sorrow, grief, all of that was there. But paradoxically, and certainly this was not something that I expected as a researcher, but the children talked about their time in the bush with um, feelings of nostalgia, um, they talked about it, the bush as being a place of love, of cohesion, and even of enjoyment. And so they spoke of their family in the bush um, as a place of unity, a place of solidarity. And so I thought, how is this possible? How, are the, how is it that these children are talking about their fathers um, that they knew in the bush um, and the context with such positive um, realities? And so um, while many of the children saw their mother and their father together, they didn't have an understanding of the context of forced marriage and what that meant. 
Um, and they would only see their fathers in the domestic context and didn't know what he was doing um, on the war front. So they remembered their time in the bush as a strong sense of family, of togetherness, and love and unity. As this child said, I used to consider us a big family while we were in the bush because I was with my father and other siblings. Unlike my family now, after the war, where I'm just with my mother and a few of my siblings. To me, the family that I'm in now, post-war, is a weaker family than the one that I had in the bush. So this bush concept was a place imbued with positive memories, meaning, and contributed to their identities. And what was also a very surprising thing for me was in the literature and, and in um, media, we hear about the portrayals of LRA commanders as fierce, as abusive, as violent. And when children talked about their fathers, they didn't talk about them like that. They talked about them highlighting um, their, the love that their father showed them, um, the care and the protection that their father showed them. And I wanted to um, give a quote of one um, young person whose father was actually the LRA leader, Joseph Coney. He said, my fatherly love was the best thing about life in the bush. I would eat from my father's plate. It would make me feel so happy. I love him, my father, so much and needed his attention. I think that he knew that. He is the best father. Personally, I love my father so much. I miss my father. I miss his fatherly love. If I'm to choose between my mother and my father, then I would choose my father. So there was, however, ambivalence because a lot of these children knew that their fathers had engaged in brutal acts of violence. And so they, uh, they were aware of the ambivalence, felt the ambivalence and the confusion, but ultimately didn't alter their love for their fathers. A quick um, also overview of their feelings towards their mothers. Um, the, the relationship between the mothers and their children was often fraught with um, ambiguous feelings as well. Uh, for women and girls who gave birth to children in the bush, this put them at huge danger, both themselves and their children. And having been born of rape, um, these mothers felt incredibly ambivalent about giving birth to these children. And that often um, led to uh, a strained relationship. And yet, the children talked about their mothers as a core source of love, protection, and support. Um, and I wanted to read one quote from um, a young person who talked about his mother and her struggle um, and sacrifice and suffering that she did to protect him. I stayed hungry for one week and my mother said she thought I was not going to live. So my mother decided to escape. She carried one AK-47. She never shot anybody dead during the escape. We reached a garden, and my mother saw the LRA moving, and, and we hid in the bush. She entered a cassava garden and uprooted some for us. We continued with the journey. We were seen by a vehicle. It seems that it was a Red Cross vehicle. The vehicle was carrying dead bodies. They saw my mother, and she ran back to the bush. They found her and captured her. She held my hand. She never left me. At the end of the war, um, coming out of the bush, the NGOs were often telling these uh, children and women that go back to your communities. Your, your communities and your people are waiting for you. And um, when they went back to their communities, this was in fact not the case. And um, for most of these uh, children and, and women that I'm talking about, they were uh, left with and faced profound forms of stigma and, and uh, violence as well. And I wanted to give you a, a sense from a, a young person the experience of this uh, stigma and violence after the war. Life is hard here because people stigmatize us. They have turned their hate against us. In my family, they hate the three of us who were born in captivity. My uncle beats us and said he would kill us. He doesn't want rebel children, Coney children, at home. So these children um, are essentially being blamed for the atrocities that were committed by their fathers. And this stigma and violence has translated into real-life obstacles um, and profound forms of social exclusion, whether it be in school, whether it be within the small family context, or within the larger community. So when thinking back to uh, their lives during the war and considering their lives after the war where they were uh, 
victimized through stigma and, and, and violence and exclusion. When thinking about the two, the children would say, you know what, yes, the war was horrific and horrible, and at least now I have food. But I think that overall, I would have to say that my life was actually better during the war. And so despite this profound deprivation and violence, children individually and collectively articulated that war was better than peace. The way we were loved and treated by our parents in the bush was better than now. While we were in the bush, we were not insulted like here at home. When we were born, we had both our mother and our father. We also had better clothes to wear, unlike here where our clothes are not nice. We also had nice food to eat while we were in the bush. Here, we cannot eat peacefully without our grandmother grumbling about how feeding us has become a burden to her. So the reality is that these children that I'm talking about fit technically within the definition of a child soldier or children that have been associated with an armed group. And yet their distinct circumstances, their life histories, and their post-conflict realities call, in my view, for responses that are unique uh, to, their, to their needs and, and realities. And yet this group of children has been largely overlooked and under-researched um, in terms of global politics and uh, post-conflict peace building. The fact that participants in, in the study identified war and captivity when violence, upheaval, deprivation, and ongoing terror was at its height as better than life during peacetime is highly disconcerting, and it demonstrates the extent of their uh, perceived marginalization. And not only does it point to a failure to integrate children who've been born in LRA captivity in meaningful, cohesive ways in the post-war context, but it also demonstrates the urgent need for targeted forms of support and services that reflect children's expressed needs. So, and there is a currently a strong policy on the prevention of child recruitment into armed conflict, whether it is through force or non-force. And this focus is important and it's understandable given the unacceptable numbers of children who are recruited into armed groups. But this focus on recruitment is uh, may unwittingly obscure the reality that children are born into and raised um, within armed groups. So, and while children born into um, armed groups, again, again, as I said, technically fit into the conceptualization of child soldiers, their experiences um, and their views on place, on home, uh, on family and post-war reintegration highlight that they have unique um, needs that demand uh, further attention. Thank you so much. I'm going to talk to you about a different armed conflict, but there are many similarities with the conflict that Miriam has talked about in northern Uganda with the one in Sierra Leone. The West African country of Sierra Leone was embroiled in armed conflict from 1991 to 2002. During that war, tens of thousands of children were used by fighters uh, within armed groups. Children were abducted, coerced, and recruited in large numbers to fight for three main fighter groups, uh, two of which were rebel groups, the Revolutionary United Front, or RUF, and the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, or AFRC, and the third group was a pro-government militia called the Civil Defense Forces. So I will talk about all three of these groups. Following the conflict, the Special Court for Sierra Leone was created. This is an international criminal tribunal created as a result of an agreement between the government of Sierra Leone and the United Nations after discussion within the United Nations Security Council. And that court was tasked with prosecuting those who bore the greatest responsibility for crimes committed during the latter part of the conflict from, two, from 1996 to 2002. And given the widespread nature of the recruitment and use of child soldiers, it's not a surprise that that court had within it the crime, the war crime, of recruitment and use of child soldiers. And it became the first international criminal court to convict individuals for this particular crime. 
Now, in all of the cases, there was testimony by individuals who were child soldiers during the conflict. So, <clears throat> for my chapter, for the book, <clears throat> sorry, I looked at the testimony, <clears throat> sorry about that, uh, given to the court through the transcripts of the special court and also the way in which that testimony was reflected in the judgments of the court. So I'm going, what I'm talking to you about today is a distillation of what the individuals who were boy and girl soldiers said to that particular court. And let me talk about boy soldiers first because their experiences became emblematic of the child soldier experience within the special court for Sierra Leone, and I would argue uh, in, in the wider international criminal law community today. So speaking about the boys, in the Revolutionary United Front and the Armed Forces uh, Revolutionary Council, the rebel groups, both of the rebel groups engaged in widespread abduction and recruitment of boys <coughs> as combatants. The RUF uh, recruited approximately 15,000 boy soldiers, and the AFRC used an estimated 3,300 boy soldiers during the armed conflict. The experience of these boys often began with abduction, followed by training in AFRC and RUF uh, training camps, and then the boys were assigned to units. The smallest boys were assigned to something called the small boys units. After training, many boys were assigned to fight either in active combat or to serve as guards. And these guards could be guards for more senior soldiers within their fighting group, or it could be at the diamond mines in Sierra Leone. But the training and deployment experience was largely one of physical and psychological violence. In the AFRC trial, there were two main child soldier witnesses who told their stories around which much of the narrative was encapsulated by the court. And I'll tell you about one of them. His pseudonym for the trial, because they, he didn't use his real name, was witness TF1157. He was 13 years old when he was abducted from his village and he was abducted alongside his 10 year old brother. AFRC rebels had overrun the village and captured him and his brother as well as other young people. He watched the rebels commit atrocities against his family, including hacking his father to death, and then he was abducted along with the other children and forced to, to carry goods all the way back to the rebel camp. He carried rice, he carried luggage, he had to fetch water, he had to pound rice, and he had to carry whatever else was given to him. He was subsequently forced to undergo military training and then forced to take cocaine. He was forced to kill people, he was forced to burn vehicles and, he burn, and, and burn houses. He eventually escaped when there was an opening to do so during the Freetown invasion retreat and ended up in the care of UNICEF. The RUF and Charles Taylor trials kind of elaborated on this type of story further. And the evidence in those two trials showed that boys from the age of seven and up were targeted for abduction or coercion by the RUF. Their military training usually lasted anywhere from two weeks to six months, depending on the point of the uh, armed conflict. And many died during this military training. This is because they were using live weapons, live ammunition. They were learning how to fire rocket propelled gr grenades uh, to uh, disassemble and reassemble guns, dodge bullets, mount attacks on urban communities, and set fire to houses. One of the accused, Issa Sise, in the RUF trials, one of the people who was on trial, uh, the child soldiers who were testifying in that trial uh, made the allegation that he had told them that he would personally come and execute them if they didn't follow the orders during combat, during battle. Boys sent to the RUF training camp uh, reported to the special court that they had the letters RUF forcibly carved into their foreheads or their chests or their backs in order to deter them from escaping. 
because the RUF was reviled, um, if they had escaped and they had these letters on them that were visible, then uh, their fear, what they were told, is that they would be killed by others. And as I mentioned, the boy soldiers were routinely given alcohol and drugs in order to make them fearless and carry out orders uh, without hesitation. And of course, some of the children became addicted. They also told the court that once they were deployed to fight, they <coughs> killed children, elderly men and women, and teenagers. They would beat people, they raped women and girls, they captured girls to give to their commanders to rape, they committed amputations, they flogged civilians, they beheaded corpses, they helped to abduct other children, they burned buildings, and they looted homes, vehicles, hospitals, and businesses. The court also heard acts of resistance. For example, witness TF1-143 refused orders to rape an elderly woman, woman on a food-finding mission, and as a result, he was severely punished for not listening to his commanders. Why were boys, boys targeted? Well, they told the court that they thought they were targeted because of their small size and agility, their pliability, their eagerness to please adults, and because the younger boys were particularly aggressive and when armed and known to kill people as if they were simply chickens. While the experiences of boys within the AFRC and RUF showed, um, it was discussed in depth by the court and showed many aspects of their lives, there were certain aspects of their experiences that the court did not ask about. In particularly, sexual violence committed against these boys was not explored at all by the court. In addition, the court did not explore the victim status of these boys who were forced to commit <coughs> rape and sexual violence. That was not discussed at all in the court. So now that I've outlined the kind of emblematic child soldier that was discussed in the special court, I want to turn now to the experience of girls and then the experience of those who were within the pro-government militia forces because these experiences were somewhat similar but also somewhat different. It's estimated that up to one-third of all of the children abducted or, co or coerced into the rebel groups were girls. That there were 7,500 girls in the RUF and 1,600 girls in the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council. And the rebels abdu abducted girls for two main reasons. One is simply to have more bodies to fight for them. So they abducted girls just like they abducted boys in order to fill out their ranks and to carry out the fighter uh, activities that I've already mentioned with respect to the boy soldiers. So girls appeared before the special court and talked about their experiences as girl soldiers much in the same way and going through similar experiences as the boys that I've just described. However, the rebels also wanted to create or recreate a very gendered socioeconomic order mm -hmm. in order for them to be able to carry out their fighting in the way that they uh, wanted. So they created a socioeconomic caregiving structure in which they abducted girls or coerced girls to cook, clean, grow and harvest food, nurse the sick and wounded, and serve as sexual slaves for the fighters. And many of the girls were categorized by the rebels as so-called bushwives, which meant they were expected to submit to rape on demand by their so-called husbands who were fighters in the same armed group. A large number of them became pregnant as a result, and so they were expected to also bear the children and rear the children in the bush. The roles of these girls were multifaceted. So oftentimes, they considered that their main role was that as, as fighter, and their secondary role was that as a bushwife. But sometimes, um, from the point of view of the armed group, it was the opposite. But at any rate, it was multifaceted. They, they often would have dual identities at the same time. The prosecutor of the special court, however, divided their lives in a way into two. So, and this is because of the way criminal charges work. So he charged the child soldier aspects, the fighting aspects, the being uh, trained in weapons, etc. aspects, and charged that under the war crime of recruitment or use of child soldiers. And 
Separately, he charged crimes against humanity and war crimes of rape and sexual slavery and outrages upon personal dignity. And in doing that, what ended up happening is that girls who appeared before the court had to fulfill the evidentiary aspect of the second group, the, the sexual violence aspect. And so they were asked more questions and more time was spent with them on their sexual, um, their sexual victimization. So what ended up happening is that boys were the ones that testified for the most part to the aspects of being a child soldier. And there was this distinction between the two. And while there was some evidence from the girls about their time in the army groups that filled, uh, that, that satisfied the elements of crime for the recruitment and use of child soldiers, for the most part they were viewed as those who gave evidence in sexual violence. Now the court did hear about how girls suffered post-conflict and this goes to uh, what Miriam has talked about. One witness who successfully escaped the RUF but who was pregnant on her escape because she had been raped by soldiers within the RUF explained how once she got back to her home village, people ostracized her and her child as a rebel, as rebels, and that they were rejected. They were accepted by her family, her immediate family, but they were rejected by everyone else. And as she was giving her testimony, she talked about how hurt she was, that this ostracism continued to the day of her testimony and, and presumably afterwards. Nine years between when she returned home and when she gave the testimony at the special court. And I'll now turn to the last category of child soldiers that were discussed within the special court for Sierra Leone. And these are the pro-government militia child soldiers for the civil defense forces. The civil defense forces were interesting because the CDF were viewed as heroes by many in Sierra Leone, so there wasn't the same stigma for a child to serve in the CDF as it was for a child who had served with the AFRC or the RUF rebels. And given that, it was very difficult for the special court to secure anyone who was willing to testify, a child soldier to testify against the CDF, against their own militia group, pro-government militia group. And therefore, the only evidence that we had of child soldiers, <coughs> direct evidence, was from those who had been originally kidnapped by the rebels and then captured by the CDF and then forced to fight for the CDF. So in a way, they didn't have that inbuilt allegiance to having volunteered or, um, or been selected to fight for the CDF. They were forced to fight for the CDF. And that ended up creating a bit of a skewed uh, explanation of child soldiers with respect to the CDF. The CDF did recruit children in large numbers. There were 17,000 children within the CDF, which totaled 69,000 fighters at its height. And of those, 15,000 were boy soldiers and 2,000 were girl soldiers. The court only heard from boys in this case, so we only heard one side of the story. And even at that, as I mentioned, they only heard from those who had been originally captured by rebels, forced to fight for rebels, and then forced, captured again and forced to fight for the CDF. The boys who testified before the Special Court for Sierra Leone talked about their time in the CDF in a way that was remarkably similar to that of their time with the rebels, but also uh, they spoke about different types of atrocities as well as dif some different experiences. So they were subjected to torture upon being captured by the CDF. Mm -hmm. They were often um, asked to undertake cannibalism. There was, of course, forced portering, forced drug use, and forced atrocities committed against civilians, like sitting, setting civilians on fire. So some of their experiences were very similar. Some were slightly different. But the CDF trial had these invis invisibilities. One invisibility, no experience of girls were talked about. There were no girl soldier experiences talked about with respect to the CDF. And as I mentioned, there were no stories of boys who had joined the CDF um, as part of their own community to try and protect their own community. So in the end, my conclusions with respect to looking at the transcripts and the trial judgments of the Special Court for Sierra Leone 
is that boys were specifically targeted by rebels based on gendered views of their obedience, their agility, their ferocity, and they were trained and sent to the front lines or to serve as guards based on that gendered understanding of who they are and who they could be. Girls were targeted based on gendered views about their utility for domestic work and sexual slavery, while also being trained as fighters, though less often sent to the front lines. But the special court also received only a partial story of child soldiers within the CDF and did not cons consider the recruitment and use of girls in that armed group. So the special court was rightfully lauded for servicing, for bringing to the surface the experiences of, of uh, child soldiers in many different aspects in the conflict in Sierra Leone. But I think at the same time, we need to keep in mind the silences that I've mentioned so that future tribunals can be alert to gender blind spots to, in order to render all child soldiers visible. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, first of all, thanks, Mark, for in, inviting us. And uh, for me, it was actually a nice reunion to see people I've seen before. Um, I'm going to talk about the experiences of child soldiers in refugee systems around the world. You might have already noticed a trend among the discussions before this one is that there is a profound dilemma in the situation of child soldiers. On one hand, they have been usually very severely victimized. On the other hand, there's also been involved in very, very serious crimes. That dilemma has not been fully addressed in, in, in the criminal aspect when dealing with crime soldiers, neither at the international level. Uh, uh, Valerie already mentioned one international tribunal, there have been more. And the only court will deal with it probably is the Desmond Court that Mohammed refers to in the case of uh, um, um, Unwen that will be decided uh, very soon and although he was charged for crimes committed after he became 18, he was clearly influenced what he did before he was 18 when he joined the, uh, the LRA a uh, long time before. So the fact that nothing has been dealt with with child soldiers in this, this a dilemma at the criminal side. Although there have been criminal trials in some countries in Africa, most of the time criminal perpetrators are dealt with in the sense that they are primarily children, primarily victims, and they looked at from a rehabilitation aspect. So what do you do with children who have been victimized but have also committed horrendous crimes? And that dilemma that puzzle has been addressed in countries dealing with child soldiers who came to the shores as refugees or at least asylum seekers. And that's what I'm going to talk about. This. First, in terms of background, as of 2015, there were 70 million people displaced. That means they actually had to leave the places because of violence surrounding them. Of those 70 million people, 23 people were refugees, meaning they crossed state borders in order to find safety. Of those 22 million people, half are children. 300,000 people of those children are without parents, living in refugee camps or trying to come to mostly European or North American countries. For them to come to Europe and North America is very perilous. They face a number of obstacles. You would think you would hope when they arrive in those countries, the journey would be over. Unfortunately, in some respects, it just starts. But they might have overcome physical obstacles, but now they're going to be facing legal obstacles. Because they typically will, will ask for asylum or refugee status. And in order to become a refugee, gives you a great deal of benefits. If you are found to a refugee in North America or Europe, you're entitled to education. You're entitled to, to welfare. You're entitled to, uh, uh, to housing. And most importantly, you're entitled not to be removed from the country where you have been found to be a refugee. But in order to become a refugee, you have to go to a number of hoops. And they can be characterized in two main groups. The first group is 
that the refugee convention, which is the main treaty dealing with giving status to people who want to become refugees, is that if you are found by decision maker that you are a criminal, you by definition not entitled to any of the benefits. However, if you pass that particular hurdle, you still have to prove, secondly, that you face persecution from the country where you left. So, let's start with the first hurdle, which is particularly relevant for child soldiers. How do you deal with a child soldier who is involved in crimes? And on the Refugee Convention, the crimes which will prohibit you from becoming a refugee are either international crimes, such as war crimes occurring against humanity and genocide, or senior regular, sorry, uh, serious regular crimes such as killing, murder, and rape. And there have been a number of countries, uh, I looked in my chapter about a dozen countries, that looked at people, child soldiers, who would have been involved in battle and who actually committed those crimes. As I said, if they found to have committed those crimes, they are out. They cannot go any further, as basically you have to go back to your country of origin. And child soldiers, what has, has happened, um, courts in those countries developed a, an approach to see whether or not they could tell children, they could tell whether children, even being involved in crimes, they could be found not to be excluded. In other words, they could go to the next step and see whether they could be a refugee. And what the courts have looked at, and by the way, in the Netherlands, even legislation, they looked at factors of how did you join an armed group? Was it forcibly recruited or did you join voluntarily? How long did you stay? Uh, what rank did you reach? How did you try to leave? And the age as well, like how, how, how early in your, in your life did you join? For instance, in the Dutch legislation, it says if you join an armed group before the age of 15, that factor will automatically will not bring you to exclusion. If you're 15 or older, you go straight to the, to the side as if you're persecu being persecuted. Other countries have sort of, uh, didn't give like a, a, a particular line of age, but be more sort of looking at, at, at a balance. So it's like age, how you joined, how you left, and also how serious were your crimes. That means that people who joined briefly didn't move up in the, in the hierarchy were a fairly young, uh, young age, and the criminality was minimal, they tend to be allowed to go to the next stage to see whether they have been persecuted. However, if you don't fit that actually smaller group, and you were like a serious criminal, so to speak, stayed for a long time, you will be excluded. And it means, eventually, you will be returned to your country. Okay? Now, the other group, the, the group who sort of survives, so to speak, the exclusion phase, they go to the inclusion phase, whether they were persecuted. Oh, I forgot one thing. I should go back to the exclusion phase. What Sheldon has done a lot is say, okay, I did those crimes, but she already heard they were forced. So the courts had to deal with, okay, how much force you were suspect, uh, subjected to is suffi sufficient for us to decide that you're actually not a criminal. And imagine decisions being made by, by decision makers. They have to talk about horrendous situations that the children face thousands of miles away and try to figure out were you actually forced or not. And the force they're talking about, the defense being used, is the defense of duress. It means that you did something under orders, and those orders were more severe than what you were asked to do. In other words, if you say were ordered to rape somebody and but if you did not do it, you are killed, yes, the defense is made out, okay? Interestingly enough, in all the decisions I looked at, the first address was, was, was raised quite often because most child soldiers had been involved in serious crime. They were not minimally criminally active. So they always raised the defense of the rest. Guess what? Every single case, this defense was rejected, either based on credibility, say, we well, don't believe, you just made it up to actually get, become a refugee, or because they could not make out that what they were ordered to, ordered to do was not worse than what they might be subjected to. So no defense of the rest has been actually accepted so far in the court systems of the southern countries. Okay, go back to inclusion. So they passed the stage, they've been found here, might have been forward only minimally, even not very long. Let's see whether you can actually get the refugee status. That's the other hurdle. Because in order to be, get refugee status, you first have to belong to a certain group that is defined in the Refugee Convention. And those groups are political, 
ethnic, national and political. It has been held that South child soldiers only fit in the social group. So they have to make out that the group they belong to, and the whole definition of what the social group means, which I won't go into right now, to show that they actually should be a social group. And that has not been successful all the time either, because uh, has been like some child sort of said, well, I should belong in this group because I, f I faced PTSD because of my experience. And courts have said, like in the UK, PTSD by itself is not sufficiently to put you in a social group. It is way too large a group. However, if it's severe PTSD, if you return, a severe PTSD that amounts to you completely falling apart mentally, we might consider you in a small social group of people with severe PTSD. Another group that was tried was child soldiers. Again, courts have said the group is too broad, that it will capture everything. But if it says child soldiers who are involved in, in armed, armed groups, armed battles, that's small enough to allow you there in, in the particular group. So, you have to fit that group, not easy. Then secondly, you have to show you would face persecution. And for persecution, not what you faced in the past, but what also what you might face if you were to go back. And most children have no problem saying, yeah, what happened to me, you had experience that, that Valerie and Miriam explained. No problem saying I was persecuted. But the question is, what if you go back? And then a very ironic thing has happened. A number of countries, including Sierra Leone and Uganda, have put in place peace treatments, peace agreements. The country has stabilized to some extent. So if the, and the court has said, if you go back now, you go back to a fairly peaceful country and would face persecution. So the irony is, if you come to a country in Europe or North America, claim you have your status right away, get processed very quickly before there's any reconciliation, you might actually be a refugee. If it takes a long time, like 10, 12 years, you say, sorry, too late, everything is fine, I can go back. So as a result of those confluence of factors, both on the exclusion side, there are a large number of children who have not given refugee status. And the result will be they, they will have to go back at some point to the country of origin. Now, having said that, there are some programs in place in those countries to say, well, if people have been in, in our country for a long time, kept the nose clean, we will try to find humanitarian solutions. And that is happening more. And actually, those solutions have been proposed for adults. And it looks at things, okay, how long have you been here? How well did you adapt? Did you try to go to other places? And we'll balance what you have done in the past to what you can bring to our country. There's been no particular decisions or policies about children, but my hope and my feeling is that some of those factors that I just set out for you will be dealt with more in favor for children than for adults. So in that sense, there is some um, feeling of, of, positive, of, of, of positive feelings, but on the whole, for children who've been child soldiers to come to countries as refugees, their future is still quite dim. Thank you. So we have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, for a question and answer and a broader discussion. Maybe I'll get the ball rolling by just mentioning a couple of points that one can sort of distill out of the various presentations. One big question is, how should one speak about child soldiers? How to narratively relate their experiences and their wishes and wants. We hear from <coughs> Professor Kamara how literature is rich and energetic and nuanced and elegant. How literature comes forward with these particular stories with a view to sharing them, disseminating them, and articulating them. And then we hear from Joseph Rickoff how those stories then in a world of law have to interface and interact with law. And the richness of the literary narrative as a communicative mechanism can interface with law in ways that are very brusque, in ways that are very categoric, in ways that are very reductive, in ways that may overindulge certain qualities, 
and be excessively exigent with regards to other qualities. So we have this dynamic in refugee determinations of the richness and ambiguity and nuance colliding with what we all think are core elements of law, which is clarity and category. So how to make sense of that? I also think in uh, Joseph's presentation, we really see another very important political characteristic that emerges, namely the faultless passive victim narrative of child soldiers as faultless passive victims tends to stop when faultless passive victims apply for refugee status to come here, for example, which suggests to me that we don't really believe that narrative or we're perfectly happy externalizing that narrative onto the places where child soldiering occurs, but we ourselves don't want to take that particular risk. We hear from Miriam, I think, a, a particularly poignant quote. What do you do when someone feels that war is better than peace? How do you speak to that person? Do you talk over them? Do you lecture them? Do you tutor them? Do you scold them? Do you condescend them? Do you tell them that they're wrong? How do you listen to that? And what do you do about it? And I think one very important aspect in thinking about child soldiering is the simple communicative act of how do you listen? How do you respond? How do you empower? How do you connect programming for former child soldiers to a broader vision of juvenile rights across the board? And that's fair, a connection that's actually fairly frayed at the moment. From Valerie, we hear how child soldiering maps onto, reinforces, and at the same time challenges gender-based constructions of life and identity. And this is a crucially important reality because 40% of child soldiers worldwide, according to general statistics, are girls. And girls, for the most part, in their soldiering experiences, are under-discussed and undervalued. Also from Valerie, we hear about this important point of multiple acts, multiple identities, the fact that your identity in war isn't frozen in some stasis, but may be staged and staggered, even within the same individual, may do very different things at different times. And how, in the end, do we speak about that? Which also brings us back to Professor Kamara, to think about the role of the role of autobiography versus the role of human rights activists speaking on behalf of the individuals that they're hoping to help. Who has the voice? What voices are we listening to? Today in our presentation, we've talked a lot about child soldiering in Africa. But today, the major hotspots of child soldiering are no longer in Africa. It tends to be in the Middle East, the Arabian Peninsula. And this phenomenon may wax and wane, ebb and flow, depending on conflict. One other interesting and important point. We've talked a lot about children in armed groups. Of course, the child soldiering definition is limited to that. What can we learn, though, about children in criminal groups, criminal syndicates, organized crime? transnational cartels for drugs, trafficking, labor. The recruitment processes of many of these groups are quite similar to armed groups. But yet, because those criminal groups lack the capacity to engage in armed conflict, they don't fit within the frame of child soldiering. But yet, there's <clears throat> got to be some crossover effect. And this is a topic that I'm particularly interested right now and I'm beginning to think through. So with those pivots in mind, we'll turn it over. Questions, comments, feedback, don't be shy. Uh, Mark. Thank you, Mark. I'm never shy. <laughs> uh, a number of the speakers have mentioned the Ongwin case. And um, as is appropriate in a law school, uh, we do uh, have to look at policy reasons and social reasons, but also we have to look at the law. And uh, as I recall, please, this is just working on my memory. Angwin was taken as a child soldier, I believe abducted when he was about 11. Mm -hmm. And he had faced prosecution for crimes he committed from the time he would turn 18 to 26. 
or 27. He was apprehended in his early 30s, maybe 32 or 33. Now, this raises so many questions because this is actually child soldiers perpetrator. Uh, he, of course, because under the Rome the statute, you cannot be charged for anything you do under the age of 18. So he's charged after that period. He'd also achieved a certain degree of prominence. What should the court have done or do? Is there a, well, what some would say, not me, but some would say, an excuse for life once you've had that upbringing? Uh, that can transcend if he was a leader that was uh, abducting more children and creating a greater problem. Can he still rely upon his horrible childhood as a child soldier? And if so, what's the legal basis for it? Now, uh, uh, one speaker mentioned the uh, duress. But of course, you know, and duress is a defense in the Rome Statute, as is mental incapacity. But in virtually all common law systems, and in most civil law systems, with some exceptions, I think Italy, duress is not a defense to murder. Uh, so duress does not seem to be an available defense, nor would mental incapacity, because the Rome Statute is something like McDonald. So, What's the legal basis? How do you defend a case like that? At what point, if any, should a former child soldier take responsibility for their actions? Or is that just incongruous with the reality? And this is a question open to all of the speakers. Do we want to respond to Mark, or do we want to take a couple more questions and then respond as like a grab bag? <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? All right, why don't we take two more, and then we can all respond collectively. So, Here, we've got, I'm right. forward. so uh, when you go through the refugee application process, is there some form of more objective psychological analysis that can go on simultaneously, so that way the judge, or whoever the decision maker is, isn't the sole person deciding if they're telling the truth or not? Is there somebody else who's evaluating what they're saying, who's actually someone of a you know, professional in that capacity? All right, we have another one? So We'll take two. I, I'm kind of confused with the interim period of a, uh, a child seeking refugee status in this long drawn out process of gaining status. What does it look like for a child in that situation? Um, are they robbed of any kind of upbringing or development? Yeah. Um, I wanted to. I did, I, I didn't imagine. It. <laughs> <laughs> Was it not okay. um, I wanted to go off with Professor Nilsgaard's question. Um, the conflict in Uganda started in, if there was a child born in the early years, they would have been over the age of 21 or at 21 um, by the time it ended. So how would that translate for a child that was born in captivity that transformed into a child soldier and then further into an adult? Okay, so we got stuff on northern Uganda, on Gwen, and refugee stuff. Who would like to start? Mohammed, do you want to start? Yes, yeah. um, the Ongwen case. So I'm, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Thank God. Professor. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to make that judgment, right? In, in, in any case, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, and of course, as I, and I address it to a bit of extent in my, in my chapter, uh, Dominic Ongwen, I compare him to Ishmael Bear, the only of the three major characters that I looked at actually is a real life person who experienced uh, conflict. Uh, and Johnny, and of course, uh, Birahim are the two other characters. Uh, and I make reference to what McDrumble has said in at least a couple of occasions uh, regarding the law and literature, the law and narrative. Uh, and I use the statement by Fatou Bensouda, who is the chief prosecutor in this case, who says, 
Of course, her goal is to find Dominic Ongwen guilty and to punish him for what he did. Uh, not what happened to him as a child, but what he himself did after becoming an adult uh, and the decisions that he made to recruit more children, but also his refusal uh, to some extent to escape when he could have escaped uh, as an adult. Uh, but she says that we may take into account the fact that he was a child when he was abducted and became a child soldier is a recognition on the part of the law of the significance of this gray area of this uh, that literature is so good at, at presenting that narrative blurring the lines between what is clear and what is unclear which law by virtue of what it does doesn't do quite well, because you are either guilty or you are not guilty. But the value of literature, of narrative, but also the opportunity that people have to tell this story in the court of law uh, plays a significant role uh, in whatever judgment that might be made in the case of, uh, of Dominic Ongwen. Uh, and briefly, uh, I conclude that particular section of the book by referring to Ishmael Bear, because he admits that what he did was wrong. He was demobilized at the age of 15, so he was still a child. So his situation is not as complicated as Dominic Ongwen. But even at that, writing now as an adult, he tells us that I was not 100% innocent because I did some of the things that I did, knowing what I did, even though I was a child. But he admits his fault, and which Dominic Ongwen is not doing at all. He is blaming everything entirely on his abductors and on war itself, mm -hmm. so which, which further complicates uh, the, the, the case uh, here for him. On you guys jump in on northern Uganda? It's such a huge question that you're, it's like the question, right? What do we do with Um I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to address the legal aspects of it, but I, I think what I can bring to the conversation is, is going to only bring it more muddiness, but I will do it anyway. Um, so I'm going to give you the example of one of the young people that I, that I interviewed. Um, he happens to be the child of Joseph Coney, one of his many children. Um, when he was in the bush, he talks about the reality that his father had um, sort of chosen him as a, a future leader and had, was basically molding him to be um, a very powerful LRA fighter. And as uh, an eight-year-old began to internalize all of this, and when he was, his mother escaped with him uh, and her four children when he was uh, 10. So he comes back into post-conflict northern Uganda and he still has this mentality of um, and, and his father had told him, even when you leave, you can continue to mobilize for us. So he comes back um, and begins to mobilize other kids uh, in post-war northern Uganda. And he calls himself by the name that he was given by his father, which I'm not going to repeat, but it's, it's a name that is immediately recognizable to anybody um, that he would have been in the LRA. And so um, he's you know, living like this, beginning to recruit other children, beginning to mobilize in an armed group. And he, he, when I spoke with him, he basically said that if I had not left and I had not gotten the appropriate intervention and support, I was going in that direction and I would have become somebody like on when. And I think for um, the local U northern Ugandan population, it goes back to your question, a little bit is, I think local northern Ugandans feel like on when is could have been any of us, um, and so why him? Why are you pointing to him when so many of us were in that situation and ended up in that situation for a variety of reasons like um, survival, um, even when you're 18, when you're 19, um, power. Um, that you're rewarded the more violent you are, you rise in the ranks. Uh, the more violent you are, and that's also a protective factor uh, for you and your family. So there's all these complicated questions 
um, that muddy the waters um, as to what we do with him. But I think on one is like a um, one example of many people, and I think that the uh, frustration in northern Uganda is why why is everyone turning to him? Because there were so many people who were also responsible. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add because uh, it's already been pointing out that this is a very complicated scenario and I don't know the legal answer. I don't know. Ongwen is a complex perpetrator and that's the term that has been used to try to capture the fact of someone who's been victimized and becomes then a victimizer. And it's really unclear where the line should be drawn. So the prosecutor has argued exactly uh, what Mohammed has talked about where um, that there was some agency that Angwen could have asserted some agency and chose and, and used that agency to continue in what he was doing in the LRA, whereas his defense is arguing that all of the choices that were made were due to a flawed thought process that was created when he was a child soldier. And we can see the two different narratives that are coming out through the transcripts and through the summaries of the transcripts at the court. And it will be really interesting to see how the judges, where they weigh, because if they do convict him, the prosecutor's argument is that, that the aspect of his upbringing <coughs> goes to sentencing. In other words, he can still be convicted, but the sentence should be lower to take into account his background coming in. So that's the prosecutor's approach. Um, obviously, the defense does not agree with that. But there's also a very interesting dynamic. So the first case of the International Criminal Court from 2000 as well was Thomas Lubanga, an adult out of the DRC, Dark Republic of Congo, convicted only on child soldiering crimes. And in that case, many child soldiers came forward to testify. And both expert evidence and viva voce evidence induced led to a conclusion among the judges that the child soldiering experience is really heinous. It'll scar you even intergenerationally, like it's ruinous. And that was accepted because it was powerful when it came to convicting an adult for the crime of illicit child soldiering. In Ongwen, a very different narrative is presented because Ongwen's defense is trying to say, look, in earlier cases, you came to the conclusion that the child soldiering experience is ruinous. Actually, he was nine, year old, nine years old when he was abducted. And they say, so therefore, you ought to extrapolate that to the defendant. If it was ruinous for other people, it could be ruinous for him. And in Ongwen, the overall narrative, at least what we're seeing from earlier decisions on confirmation of charges and so forth is the judges are rejecting that extreme vision of the child soldier as, as dilapidated by the experience, allowing this to go forward. So whatever vision is correct is a separate question than the thing that concerns me the most, which is one of the only things law has going for it is consistency, predictability. And there's a disjuncture between the two. Well, but what's the legal basis for it? I mean, what you're saying is that it is a scarring uh, uh, experience, and of course it is. But that's also something that would be considered by the prosecution, and that should all be directed at mitigation. Ungland is attempting to essentially carve out a legal defense, which has got to be either duress, which is probably not applicable because it's against the majority of states, or that there is some sort of diminished mental capacity that would serve as an excuse. Now, both of those arguments were raised in a confirmation of charges, and no. both were not accepted. But that's a much lower bar. I mean, they'll, they'll be brought up again in trial, so, so we'll see where so it goes. So you should it make sense? Can I just add that there's another twist to the case that we haven't really talked about yet, but it's what I mentioned with respect to Sierra Leone, is there are many, many sexual violence, charge, gender and sexual violence charges in the Ongwen case. And so they're not being considered necessarily as part and parcel of the recruitment and use of child soldiers or the fact that he was a child soldier. They're considered in the larger context of the way the LRA has set up this economy, it's a domestic and sexual economy um, internally, and then how that compares with the domestic and sexual economy um, 
or the, the place of gender within Uganda. And I think that this is really interesting because it kind of separates it off. It doesn't necessarily, it shouldn't necessarily exist separately, mm -hmm. but it's different charges and they may make a different uh, weighing in those charges under a different argument about, well, he should know better that this is frankly wrong to uh, enslave that many women as his wives or within, under his uh, command and control. But this man, this former child soldier, is facing the largest number of charges ever brought yes. internationally against anyone. It's really quite remarkable. Joseph, you're chomping. Yeah, just on the first question, be very brief, um, just to, to add or confirm or said. Um, Given the fact that some charges will stick, I mean, I mean 83 charges, something's going to stick. The fact that the uh, pretrial chamber not only dismissed his argument of duress or dismissed his upbringing, dismissed it right out of hand. Mm -hmm. And although it's a lower standard, I will be hard. I go further. I predict, <laughs> I predict here the trial chamber will find him guilty and will, what Valerie says, will take some experiences from his youth mm -hmm. into sentencing as mitigation. Not as a full defense, but I think will happen. Okay, but two more questions addressed to me. So, yep. first question was about whether or not uh, whether decision makers should or could use experts to discuss children's uh, psychological backgrounds. The problem with refugee law and decision making as a whole, it's extremely fragmented. Um, like, for instance, I know Canada fairly well, I know Australia fairly well. In Canada, the refugee decision makers um, tend to be very much attracted to either getting training or issues, and it's provided them, or they're quite attracted to call experts on issues they do know. So they might very well, and they have been inclined to call experts about possible psychological scarring. I haven't seen it in terms of child soldiers, I've seen it in terms of people who had been tortured and what the effect was. So they called experts, especially in new and novel cases. Um, I know that the Netherlands has been very proactive, but on the other hand, countries like the UK or France tend to be much more conservative. So they are much less inclined to take an approach that is more uh, holistic. So it all depends. The United Nations High Commission of Refugees, and also addresses the, the other question, the UNHCR, has produced the guidelines how to deal with child soldiers. And it say, they say things such as uh, children should be accepted immediately while the, while the claim, claim is being, being assessed. Children should be, at a minimum, be, believe what they say as a matter of credibility. Children should get... Um, proper care while they're waiting for, for, the, for the claim to be adjudicated. Uh, children uh, should be given the benefit of the doubt. Children should be, uh, be in a position that they do get some of the benefits on the refugee convention if you do the just claimants. And as to, if you translate that, say in Canada, if you're a refugee claimant, that is one uh, part of the spectrum, you are entitled to things like education, housing, and, uh, and um, social support. If you have to claim in Australia, you go to jail until your claim is being heard. Like the people always seem to talk, take the United States as an example of bad refugee policy. Australia is worse, believe me. You go to jail, most likely offshore until your claim is being heard. So not much chance of education in those kind of camps or, or jails. So there's a whole spectrum. There is the United Nations, the UNHCR is trying to put in place some general guidelines. But whether it be accepted nationally depends very much on national policies. And national policies in, in terms of refugees has been hardening over the last couple of years. I mean, the fact that if, if the rise of populism in Europe is very much connected to immigration and refugee policies. So what I'm afraid I'm seeing is that the, the, the slight uptick we had in, the, in the, like five, ten years ago to deal with refugees in the most humanitarian way possible, including children, that's starting to be to be less of an issue, and, and, and refugees as a whole, including children, are dealt with much more harshly with approval of the electorate and number of, of governments. So on that very uh, positive note. <laughs> and in fact, in the, even in the United States, it's quite an active conversation in the federal courts about whether duress could or should apply uh, with regards to this prior persecutor bar, which is what Joseph was talking about. If you're, there's evidence that you previously engaged in international crimes, 
can duress overcome that? And, and the trend is very much to the answer be no. In fact, years ago, before we changed our legal writing program, that was the legal writing, uh, the big memo in, uh, that I assigned to do in the transnational law class was on this issue of, of duress and refugee status. We're a little bit over time, but if anyone else, does anyone else have a question? That's fine if you do, it's fine if you don't. One, two, three, no. So, let's, let's um, do two things. One, for any of you who are interested, uh, the book in which uh, these wonderful individuals' contributions are, along with contributions by 30 other authors from all six continents. Um, there's one copy here. There's some pamphlets that are available for it. You can feel free to take the pamphlets. Uh, the book is here in the library. Peter Jeton, who's up in the back, has also assembled some info on uh, websites, and there's also some video explanations and explications of some of the concepts that are covered. So you're welcome to go there, come down, pick up stuff. And what's the last thing? A big round of applause.